Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is John Trusolino. John is the Director of Business Solutions for Donnelly Financial Solutions, or DFIN. With more than two decades of SEC and global reporting experience, he is leading DFIN's ESG Thought Leadership Client Engagement and Partner Program, including authoring ESG Thought Leadership geared for CFOs and finance teams, published on FEI Daily, as well as expanding ESG credentials with Berkeley U ESG Board Certification and currently working on SASB FSA training certification. Mr. Trusolino participates and leads emerging ESG reporting working groups, including EDM Council ESG Working Group, the Data Coalition Chair ESG Working Group, XBRL US Chair Regulatory Modernization Working Group, Data Quality Committee. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. Yeah, today we'll be hearing your story and learning about environmental, social, and governance, or ESG. These days, investors are increasingly applying these non-financial factors as part of their analysis process to identify material risks and growth opportunities. This is an area that's, that's pretty new to me, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about this topic, but let's start with you. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about your career journey and how it is that you got to where you are today? Uh, sure, I make it. Thank you. So I started my career in the, in the print world, and I'm um, evolving along the path of moving from uh, helping companies communicate their financials in the printed format um, as it's evolved to an electronic format, uh, very closely aligned with the migration of regulatory reporting at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so um, in the printing world, uh, in the early 90s, we helped the community move from printing documents and sending them to the SEC to the electronic Edgar filing system. And in doing so, we also built a roadmap that allowed us to move from the document format to a digitized format in the mid 2000s when the SEC created a requirement to use machine readable format. And fast forward to today, the global regulatory environment is embracing the use of machine readable formats. And so over my career, I've I've gone from watching information put on a piece of paper printed and sent out to millions of people uh, to see this information now produced in a digitized format using interoperable standards to help more efficiently and effectively communicate complete, consistent, and accurate data. And all of this while benefiting the environment by not printing these documents. Yeah, that's amazing. Technology has brought us so far in the last 20 years. Um, when I, I was an auditor, like way back when I started my career, and I can remember sending, like, sending stuff to the printers when it was actually printed format. Yes. And so um, our goal here at DFIN um, and our senior management team and board of directors are are moving toward um, 44% of our revenue uh, to be derived from SaaS products and services by 2024. And so a major shift in our platform and our service and our um, client uh, service model to support the evolution of technology tools that are used for governance and for reporting on the global scale. So let's talk about Donnelly Financial Solutions for a second, or DFIN. What exactly is it uh, that they do? Sure. Donnelly Financial Solutions was derived from the R.R. Donnelly uh, printer, who has their roots in Chicago from 1860. So I I love working for a company that has such a long history. Um, Our division was spun out in 2016 as Donnelly Financial Um, Donnelly Financial Solutions really helps companies on their evolution of risk and compliance solutions, um, bringing together both SaaS and service models to deliver fit-for-purpose solutions for clients in their risk management, regulatory, and investor communications models. So did it spring from R.R. Donnelly? R.R. Donnelly was the parent company, and we spun off um, in 2016 to create uh, DFIN. Uh, Donnelly Financial Solutions. Okay, so um, how long have you been with the organization now? 
Sure. I started with Donnelly in 2006. I came on, on then as a product specialist as the SEC was beginning their roadmap to transition from collecting documents to collecting data using a standardized format called XBRL for Extensible Business Reporting Language, which, Megan, is equivalent to thinking about the use of a barcode. When you scan a barcode, it tells you the price, the place it's manufactured, the quantity, the contents. I might even tell you um, expiration date. And so there's a machine-readable barcode on data today. And at DeepN, we think this is extremely important in the light of the fact that material isn't read today. It's, it's, it's um, used by bots, it's um, uh, algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence. So when you apply standardized interoperable data, then you can finally see the proliferation of artificial intelligence and machine learning deliver high quality, complete, consistent data. And for those in the finance industry, that's really exciting. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I don't think of data as not being read, but you're right. I mean, it's mostly being read by robots these days. Very much so. And the SEC is aware of that. And you'll see in the SEC's recent rulemaking that almost all of the new rules require some part to be formatted using structured data, whether it's an XML data stream or an XBRL or inline XBRL. The SEC and other global regulators, like in the EU for the ESEF mandate, are also requiring that. And Megan, there's one other piece of this is very important. You can have data that's standardized and data that's interoperable, but if it's not audited and there's no assurance, it misses that trust and transparency. Yeah. And so now regulators are also requiring that this data be audited. So what are your proudest achievements since joining DFIN? Sure, for me, the, the proudest achievement is to be here for the transition of disconnected documents to documents that are created using standardized interoperable machine readable information. It really helps set the stage for um, democratizing information for anyone who wants to use it and putting that information out there for machine learning, artificial intelligence to pull in the information and have that information be complete, consistent, and correct. And at Donnelly, uh, part of your role is to focus on evolving environmental, social, and governance issues. As we mentioned, this is also known as ESG. So talk to me about what ESG is and what its current role is in the financial services industry. So in the financial services industry, environmental, social, and governance, it's really starting to take traction for a couple of reasons. And CFOs and controllers and auditors are paying attention. Over the course of the last decade, environmental, social, and governance Items were communicated to various stakeholders by corporations through their communications team or their legal team or their marketing teams or even sustainability teams in a once a year practice to expose the um, values that the companies apply to their environmental, environmental principles, their social programs. Today, this information is now being measured and monetized and put into companies that this company specific KPIs. And here the CFO and the controllers are building out controls around the data to not just report it voluntarily, but to report it in the 10K or in the proxy statement as these new social programs are aligned with executive compensation programs or the, or the client's program on greenhouse gas production are set around net zero targets. And these targets need to be measured and applied against executive compensation programs. So CFO professionals, controllers, auditors are really starting to stand up alongside the sustainability teams and design these programs around the fact that risk oversight, um, a creation of a controlled environment, all of the processes in place in financial reporting are now being looked at as tools that can be used to provide more complete, consistent, and accurate data for these ESG topics. It's really interesting. How how are they monetizing things like environment and, and social uh, topics? Well, for companies that are looking at talent management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, we are in the great resignation era, right? And so turnover has become a huge problem for many boards. In fact, it's probably one of the top three challenges 
at company today at the board level and C-suite level. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion, talent management programs, these retention programs and training programs and employee-centric um, um, uh, programs are really designed around keeping that talent, retaining that talent, and bringing new talent to the company. So you're monetizing your business through a social program that was not deemed important possibly maybe five or 10 years ago, but it's become critical as companies evolve from the um, COVID pandemic and we need to work on talent management as an aspect of building long-term value for the company with a lower turnover rate. So, and you might have just answered this, but um, why is ESG more important now than ever? Are there reasons beyond talent, talent management? Sure. So the SEC in March unveiled their long-awaited climate rules And the proposed enhancement and standardization of climate um, really is the springboard for a lot of this information to be reported um, in the 10K and proxy statement. Um, But before the SEC came out with the proposed rules, they spent the last year looking at companies voluntarily disclosing this information and publishing it on their websites. And in late to mid last year, the SEC sent out comment letters Dear CEO, dear CFO, we noticed that you include greenhouse gas emissions on your ESG report on your website. What decisions did you use to not include that information if it's material in your 10K? And so the the SEC is really starting to build a roadmap that looks at the risk around greenhouse gas and the proposed rules will require companies to provide scope one, scope two, and scope three if needed. Um, greenhouse gas emissions to the SEC, and then describe how that impacts the materiality to their strategy of the, of the company in the MDNA section of their 10 Ks. So obviously, it's the CFO that's putting together the 10 K at the end of the day. Um, but like, what other role will will the CFO play in, in this PSG strategy? So. To to date, there are leaders in sustainability reporting, and DFIM did a a Pulse report in uh, January, and we looked at 100 ESG leaders across the marketing, legal, communications, IR, and finance group, 100 in the US, 100 in the UK. And we know from, from, from that survey that marketing and HR are leading the responsibility. However, we also know that over 60% of respondents said, that they had plans to bring in the financial reporting team to provide greater oversight and controls over the ESG reporting process. And then another 70% in that survey said that they had intentions on bringing a controlled environment to the ESG reporting process. And so here you see CFOs and financial reporting teams really taking the lead as they build up the best strategies and practices for bringing these teams together HR, marketing, communications with the financial reporting teams to build out the full picture of their ESG reporting process, map that, identify the gaps, and start to build the control environment that allows them to have an on-ramp for SEC reporting and prepare for this information to have limited assurance in year two of the SEC's rule um, and reasonable insurance assurance in year three. So you clearly the CFO, the controllers, the chief audit officers are all paying attention to the evolution of reporting from a communications model or a sustainability team to under the leadership of the CEO and and the audit functions within the company um, designed around higher quality and audited information. After all, when it's in the 10K, you know, you have to have your auditors review that and, you know, the board uh, has their fiduciary responsibility as well. Yeah, sounds like a. I'm I'm always talking on the podcast about uh, like silos and how finance and accounting can no longer operate in a silo. But this sounds like one clear example of of why that can no longer be. Absolutely, it's coming to a point where these silos are being torn down and they're being rearranged, and it's not one team uh, doing more than the other. Um, Our our survey also did a a study of the collaboration within companies. And we know from the survey that it is highly a collaborative process. 
um, that, that within the companies, they rely on collaboration across the company to identify responsibility of data owners and subject matter experts within various aspects of the company. Um, that may be in operations, that may be in communications, that may be in procurement, that may be in supply chain management, that are all now part of this ESG reporting process. And so it truly is a collaborative experience for companies um, and the CFO to, to bridge these teams and bring them together. And in your mind, what is the key to building an effective ESG strategy? Sure. So Deepin has developed a program where we help our clients along the path of their ESG journey, we call it. Um, many of them are will start their journey with a materiality assessment. It helps them identify the company-specific items that may be important within their sector. Um, Megan, I do like to point out some good news around this, right? It, it, it's a very challenging world for ESG reporting. There are standards that came out that help companies identify the financial material items within industries. And so there's a standard called the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB, that has identified accounting standards within 77 industries. And so if you're a CFO and you're looking for the financial material items, you can refer to the SASB standard and find those financial material items within your industry and then start to work with your team to identify, do we have these metrics? Where are those metrics? How can we account for them? Can we put them into a repeatable process? What are the gaps? Then we'll look at their peers. What are your peers doing? Are they including more or are they providing less? Because right now it's still all voluntary. And then through that process, companies identify thematic messages that they want to align with long-term business creation, um, which is part of the board's role in strategy and risk management. And so once that's all done, we bring it together and put it into a a SASB fact sheet um, or an ESG or sustainability report. Or we help the clients write content to put in their proxy statement aligned with board oversight of ESG and identify the skills matrices within the board's composition to show that the boards are following on these items. And human capital management is one of the items that we're following in. Several of our board members have a a deep background on human capital management. So we're helping them uh, prepare for it in, in those ways. So you just kind of explained how DFIN can help, but what differentiates DFIN from its competitors? Are there competitors? Absolutely. Um, So DFIN is taking the role of being a SaaS solutions provider with a level of expertise in the ESG and compliance world. And so we provide a one-stop shop for issuers to work with us as they prepare their roadmap and take their journey down the ESG reporting process. Some of our competitors only offer one aspect of software. They'll give you the tools to make it happen, but they can't help you along the journey by identifying the materiality issues. They can't do the peer analysis or create the company um, KPIs that you want to use to begin the reporting process. Or they'll just report on the information in a, a SaaS model. Um, so DFIN is the uh, solutions provider that brings this all together um, in a team that combines SaaS services and expertise within the ESG reporting domain. So is there like an ideal client of yours? I, I imagine it's hard for a lot of companies to even know where to start. That is a big question that we receive all the time, Megan. Companies want to know where to start. Yeah. And it, it often resides at the board level. Um, uh, you know, we get the feeling that boards are really starting to pay attention to this. And when they do, then it goes down to the C-suite. And the C-suite wants to know what it is my peers are doing. Um, how can I begin to understand the ESG metrics that I need to measure and manage? And we begin the journey with them by doing that materiality assessment. The good news that the SEC has put in place is their migration from voluntary reporting around greenhouse gases to mandated reporting will follow a phase in. So the largest accelerated filers will go in first. So the biggest corporations will need to comply with the SEC's mandate first. And that gives the on-ramp for the non-accelerated filers and the small business companies as they can build on the economies of scale that will come into play after helping the largest companies go through this reporting process for the first time. And in your experience, what do you see as some of the common mistakes that companies make when it comes to ESG? 
honestly, the, the most common mistake is don't wait for everything before you start down the path. Um, we are helping clients to disclose very high level information in their proxy statement about around the new committees that were created to provide oversight of ESG, including graphics that show um, where those committees are, how, the, how often those committees meet, where the senior, senior team has responsibility for um, a control environment, and, and building the, that process and communicating that in the proxy statement. You can do that while you're in the process of identifying company KPIs, while you're identifying the gaps of where data may reside and where you have to begin to collect data. And so don't wait until it's all ready. Begin the journey with small steps. Yeah, I imagine it's taking that first step as always. That's the hardest. It is taking that first step that is the hardest. And it, it's something that we catalog every year. Um, so this is the 10th year making that the DFAN will put together our guide to effective proxies. Um, this year's guide to effective proxies will take a special look at ESG oversight in the proxy statement. This is the section that has received a, a lot of attention over the last year and a half. Um, and as the SEC is requiring oversight of um, climate in their proposed rules from the board and from the C-suite, we expect this section to be to be built out as well for the 2023 proxy season, which is something that clients will begin working on soon after their annual meetings um, taking place right now. And where do you see the future of ESG heading? Yeah, so the ESG frameworks that were um, very common and defined in the industry is alphabet soup. You had SASB, you have the GRI, the Global Reporting Institute, you had TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, you had the CDP, you had the IIR standards and frameworks. The good news is there has been a consolidation, Megan, and a harmonization of these data and framework standards. And that is happening under the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB. The ISSB is working on a common core set of data points that are relevant to every company reporting on the climate spectrum. And then in different jurisdictions, you might build out on some of those reporting elements within various verticals and industry segments. But the exciting part about this is there is the focus on standardized using an independent standard organization that is managed under IFRS to create the standards. They're moving forward with interoperability so that these data sets will include machine readable information. And finally, Megan, they're requiring these data sets to be audited. So those are exciting aspects of where this is moving and how rapidly things are changing. Yeah, it'll be exciting to see how this area evolves in the coming years. So is there any other advice that you would give a CFO who is maybe, you know, just starting to think about ESG for the first time? Sure. So it's important for the CFO to, to recognize this is a journey and you really do need to um, step in and look at the existing framework within your company, um, speak with your senior team, make sure that your board is on board. And with that understanding, um, you know, we know that this is complex. We did our Pulse report and 89% of respondents said that the current process is challenging and burdensome. And so know that going into this, that the task at hand will be challenging. Um, we know that the CFO's role comes to the table with a set of strong controls over financial reporting. Those controls over financial reporting lay out the framework for the establishment of data sets that will ultimately be um, audited and, um, and then assured by third parties. And so for the, the role of the CFO, it, it's, it's working throughout management to understand a company-wide understanding of what ESG and sustainability means for that company. And then working within the company to identify subject matter experts whether they're in operations or procurement or supply chain that are important in the data collection process and then designing those systems in place that allow you to have repeatable processes for efficient, effective um, financial reporting, which will now include some of the metrics and targets that are being discussed around this ESG migration. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I'm sure this does look different for every company out there, which probably makes it a little more difficult to standardize than some other areas of finance and accounting. It does. And it's also important when the SEC made the announcement, they they announced that they're building the climate standardization enhancement on the back of existing frameworks like the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, the TCFD. The TCFD is already being used to disclose greenhouse gas for Fortune 500 companies. Um, And so the standard is already in use. And you would think that since companies are disclosing it voluntarily, the migration to a mandated report will be a little more streamlined as they have already been collecting and reporting under the four pillars. There's a governance pillar, there's a a risk management pillar, there's a strategy pillar, and metrics and targets. And then there are 11 items underneath that that inform the format that is used to communicate this information on scenario analysis of your greenhouse gas emissions, on setting resiliency tests, and developing a robust process around testing that environment and reporting that environment. And so the SEC is doing a great uh, service here by building these new reporting mandates on existing frameworks and not requiring something new. So in your current role, I mean, it's, it's no secret that the last two years have been relatively tumultuous, but what keeps you up at night as you look both near term and also long term? Sure. Near term is the growing need for an ESG resident expert within the corporation to become the go-to person that will understand the evolution of the company's ESG metrics and targets that can align with the accounting profession within the company and work with the controllership and the CFO to begin to embed these ESG metrics and targets into the company's long-term strategy and framework. And then the longer arc of this is to help the industry adopt these standards from the International Sustainability Standards Board that ultimately drive complete, consistent, and accurate data points available for all decision holders, not just your investors. Many of the Users of ESG data today are employees that want to work for a company that that expose the same values that that they have. They want to, um, you have suppliers that are asking for ESG information um, due to the work that they provide in the supply chain. They are aligned with the company's uh, ESG. You have customers and communities that are depending upon the company to not just provide a service, but to do so in light of the fact that they need to meet certain standards to support the environmental and social issues that are uh, so prominent in the um, uh, global markets today. Yeah, that's really interesting. Just curious, do you have you seen like C-suite roles created for ESG? Um, the the yes, the, the chief sustainability officer okay. is a role that, that is actually. Um, happening at the breakneck speed these days. Um, We are seeing a a chief sustainability officer role come into play um, to be that linchpin that works for um, the consistency across the domains that are in place that run the company today. And so um, elevating somebody with uh, knowledge um, within the company that understands the growing challenges around ESG reporting um, into a senior position um, is taking um, a, a more senior role within companies today. Yeah, that's really interesting. John, thank you so much for being my guest today. Megan, it was a pleasure to be here for your podcast and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, this has been a fascinating topic and I've enjoyed learning from you and thank you for sharing your knowledge and time with us. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, have a wonderful week ahead. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. 
You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Persona. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personive.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.